welcome back to another edition of Life in Basketball. I am your host, Jacob Lane, joined by my co-host, Alex Stengel, and we've got a great show in order for you tonight. You can't talk about Louisville's run to the 2005 Final Four without mentioning the play and career of our next guest. After a long and successful basketball career as a collegiate and professional where he made stops all over the world, he's now transitioned into the world of podcasting, joining us. Uh, launching a new show, show called The Player's Perspective. Excited to welcome in one of my favorite Cardinals of all time, Larry O'Bannon. Welcome into Life in Basketball. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good, man. I appreciate you guys for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here, ready to talk and uh, tell a few stories with you guys, man. And before we get into your actual playing career stories and all that, I did want to ask about The Player's Perspective podcast because there's one thing in particular – I haven't been able to get an answer on yet. And it's okay. your, main spot, your main sponsorship because I'm a huge spice, heat, hot sauce guy. And I've never heard of, I don't want to mess this up, Ken, Kentuxican bourbon yeah, hot Kentu sauce? Kentuxican bourbon hot sauce, yeah. Is it the real deal? It is, man. It's nice. It is. It is really nice. And uh, those great, great group of people, man. They have multiple products. The bourbon hot sauce is their main product, but they have a uh, different types of salsa as well but uh very nice. authentic man it's a very great product definitely go out and try it i was what's gonna say the, where, what's where the gonna go pick to? some up at yeah, yeah give the people that and tell them what's the, what's the go-to meal for you what do you put it on like what do you like what's the specialty uh you could you can find it at your local kroger's uh nice. in the okay. uh buy local section <clears throat> and a lot of times man i have it like like anytime with anything, man, for real, a lot of, you know, mainly chicken wings or, cause I'm not, you know, my wings, I'm not really a big saucy guy. I don't like my wings doused in sauce. So I like my wings kind of plain and then kind of dipping it in my own sauce. So I'm one of those type of people and uh, goes really well with fish as well, man. So uh, it's, it's hard to go wrong, man. All right. Well, you've, you've sold me. I will be headed to Kroger after this podcast to pick up a bottle of that. So right. Alex tells you a, a nice little plug there for the sponsor. So we'll come back to the podcast because I do want to obviously ask about that and your transition out of basketball. But let's start with your with your childhood uh, growing up in Louisville, playing at Mail, uh, you know, being in this community and, and basketball. What are your first memories of basketball and how was the, the game kind of introduced to you? And at what point were you like, all right, man, I've got it. Like I'm, I'm going to be able to play at a high level in this game. All right, I'll start with uh, from early on. Uh, early on, I, I come from a basketball family, so uh, I was naturally around it all the time. So it was just something that just kind of, you know, was ingrained in me and that I just saw and wanted to be a part of and sort of continue the legacy. My mom and my dad played. Uh, both of my sisters played. And so it was only natural for me to play as well. You know, when I was younger, we always played outside. It's not like the generation now where – you know, you play video games. I mean, I played video games as well, but it was more so a time where you played outside majority of the day. So when I was outside, I was always playing sports, most of the time basketball. But um, so it was just something natural for me, man. And I always looked up to uh, my sisters, my dad. My dad would always take me out in the backyard in the park and we would shoot and play. And so uh, he was a, a big, big role model for me as far as somebody that I want to look up and want to emulate. Now, as far as, Favorite players, um, you know, everybody loves Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is, you know, for me, the greatest player of all time. And, you know, but I, I was a big Ray Allen fan. I love Ray Allen. He was the reason I wore 34. Um, and even from sixth grade through my senior high school, I wore 31 because of Ed O'Bannon. Uh, I loved Ed O'Bannon, but, you know, I always patterned my game after Ray Allen. Um, and from the time when I knew I was going to play at a high level, um, it was always an aspiration. I wasn't sure how it was going to come. I knew I was always aspiring to be there. Um, I mean, there was moments where I knew I was good. Then you play against some competition, you know, from other parts of the country. And you'd be like, well, what's going on? You know, am I good enough? And then you play, be like, okay, yeah, I am good enough. So, it would probably say somewhere around, somewhere around high school where I knew, like, okay, yeah, like, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm playing at a high level with this. So I'd probably say somewhere around uh, my sophomore year in high school. And I do want to ask about your uh, your high school experience, just because obviously you went to Mayo, uh, mm -hmm. big Louisville school, and, and having the career you had in high school, I'm sure there was at times some comparison between, like, you and other local legends like Griffith and things like that. But 
how did that impact you uh, in terms of, you know, did you see yourself kind of uh, taking that as like a strive for greatness or do you, did you kind of see yourself almost always kind of caught in someone else's like local legend, like shadow, if you will? You know what? Daryl Griffith and my dad played basketball together. And so my dad awesome. would always, you know, my dad would always talk to me about him. Like Daryl Griffith, you need to look up this guy. You know, you need to, you know, see how you don't know how good he was, this and that. And so you hear the tales and the legends about him. And so, you know, just hearing my dad talk about him and rave about him, about how good he really was, that was a goal of mine when I got to high school. You know, I looked up, I seen how many points he had. I'm like, okay, he won Mr. Basketball. He won a state championship. So those were goals that I wanted to attain just because my dad, you know, was so much, uh, you know, a fan and, and really admired you know, Daryl Griffith's career that I wanted, that was a, a goal of mine that I wanted to try to achieve. Um, came up a little short um, as far as Mr. Basketball. I ain't going to say I got robbed on that, but I probably did. Um, state championship, man, seemed like I was a step short, man. Got the biggest upset in state history in the state championship. And I uh, almost scored 2,000 points, man. Got off to a little bit of a slow start in my career, but um, I sacrificed probably more individual stats for team success because we had really, really strong teams there, man. I had a bunch of great players. So um, I'll trade that any day of the week team success for over, over uh, personal stats. One of the things I found interesting today and in, in, in the last couple of days doing some research on your recruitment and, and what led you to Louisville, obviously, you know, for Alex and I, we, we kind of caught the tail end of your career in terms of our age. You know, at the, the Final Four is really some of my first memories of that team <laughs> with Francisco. I know, man, we always, we always make people laugh when we show our age here. But I, one of the things I found out was that you almost went to Dayton uh, until Rick Pitino got to Louisville and kind of got ingrained here. Um, and so take me back to that, right? Take me back to you, you think you're going to Dayton and then Rick Pitino gets involved and the opportunity to go to Louisville presents itself. What do you remember most about your recruitment with Patino specifically? And when was the moment you knew you were going to Louisville? Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll take you back to my, the, the beginning part of the recruiting process. So originally I was, I was going to go to Tennessee. I was sort of getting recruited by Tennessee and um, I wasn't going to sign until the spring because I wanted to focus on really having a good senior year because I wanted to win the state championship. I wanted to win Mr. Basketball. I really wanted to hone in and focus on my last year and enjoy it because recruiting process is a can be an overwhelming process. It's very time consuming. It's very uh, I don't want to say stressful, but it can you know it can be pressure. It should it can be pressuring, and so. Um, I want to enjoy my senior season. So at the end of my senior season, I was going to go visit Tennessee. And if I liked my visit, that's where I was going to go. But in the meantime, I, you know, I had taken a visit to Colorado. Um, I had visited UAB, uh, Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, I've been uh, recruited by UMass and a couple of other schools. But Tennessee was like my main focus. And so after the season, um, I was going to visit. And the coach got fired. And Dayton, and, and this whole time, Dayton had been recruiting me really tough, too. Dayton, had, Dayton was probably recruiting me the, the, the hardest. And so uh, after the season, Coach Tennessee got fired. So, I'm like, so new coaching staff was going in a different direction. They had already had some recruits that they were recruiting. So Tennessee was off the board. And I'm like, man, I really didn't want to go to Colorado. Like, ah, it's a football school. Um, not really wanting to go there. Um, UAB was – was okay, but I really didn't want to go to UAB, be down in Birmingham for real. So I'm like, Dayton was cool, um, had a good program, solid. Um, recruiting me, I was a priority on the recruiting list. Uh, they really put in a ton of effort to get me there. I took some unofficials there, went to some games. And so uh, I was like, man, you know what? You know, it's probably where I'm going to end up going. And so at the last minute, man, um, Rick Pitino had took a job in, uh, at Louisville. And it was a bunch of guys from the city of Louisville that were going to Louisville. But, you know, I really didn't have any plans on going to Louisville because, you know, they weren't recruiting me. Denny Crum wasn't recruiting me. I didn't get any letters, no phone calls, no anything. So uh, Louisville hadn't even really been, you know, in the back of my mind. Um, but I'd always wanted to go to UConn. And I had talked with the UConn 
coaches, they knew who I was. And, you know, I got a letter from time to time. But, you know, they were focused on recruiting uh, Ben Gordon. He was closer. He was local. And he was one of their top priorities. So uh, Ben Gordon had got the scholarship there. <laughs> so I, I can't even be mad at him for that. And so then when Rick Pitino took the job uh, at Louisville, uh, he had heard about me and wanted to come watch me play because they still had a scholarship to offer. And so when he came to watch me play, uh, he had organized some pickup with some of the top guys because coming out of the city of Louisville, man, we had about 15, 14, 15 guys that played mid to high major division one basketball. So we were playing this pickup, man. I didn't even play well. I didn't play well, but he still offered me a scholarship anyway, just for the fact that I was a good athlete and a good kid. And so uh, he took a chance on me, man. And uh, once I got there, you know, the rest is history. So one of the things that I think is a commonality with with players as they come from high school to Louisville to play for Rick Pitino is that adjustment period and not only learning the game of college basketball, but learning how to be coached by a guy like Rick Pitino, right? I mean, that's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, it's well documented that, that you guys, I, I don't want to say clash, but, you know, early on the freshmen, um, there were some struggles and just not trying to get adjusted to everything. Maybe it took a little bit of, of time for you. And um, one of the things I'm curious of, you, you hear about players who go through that and the players who decide, okay, you know what, this isn't for me, I'm going to leave. But there's a lot of other players like Russ Smith, yourself, who stuck around and, and at the end of the, their career, they're like, man, Rick Pitino, did everything I could ever ask for in a coach and helped me with my career. What is it that he challenged you the most early on in your career? Like what, what, what's the one thing he was always on you about and looking back on it, do you think that that's kind of influenced you as a, as an athlete and uh, into your professional career? Man, you hit me with some double quarter pounder questions. <laughs> uh, okay. Let, let's start with the first section. Uh, it is, it's a big adjustment, man. Um, going from being coached from a high school coach who, didn't even curse. He was a Christian man, very religious, you know, didn't believe in cursing. And to go into Rick Pitino, who was swear by anything, <laughs> about any and everything. And so uh, the biggest adjustment uh, was probably mental and physical, both. Um, getting in physical shape to be able to play the style of play that he likes to play and, and adjusting to his coaching style, man. He's, he's very hard. He's you know, very tough to play for. It's not easy to play for. But once you get adjusted to his coaching style and you learn, you know, what it is that he wants and, and how he coaches and, you know, what to, you know, let go in one ear and out the other and what to, to take in, you know, then you start to understand the method to the madness. Uh, but, you know, if you're not around it or you're not prepared for it or you don't know how to anticipate or how to understand it or digest it in the beginning, it takes some time to adjust to that. And in the beginning, yeah, it was a clash, man. It was, it was, it was a big clash. <laughs> and in, in, I think that's one thing that he really sort of starts to gain a respect about is the mental toughness because, uh, man, we, we, we had some serious clashes, man, some serious clashes. And uh, I thought he, he – I think at times he thought I was going to take the easy way out and maybe leave or go someplace else. But uh, being mentally tough and stepping up to the challenge, man, and uh, – you know, responding back. I think that earned a lot of respect for him at the end of the day. And once you got over those, you know, clashes, I mean, you guys were amazing. Um, like Jacob said, I mean, that was some of my best memories growing up watching you guys. And, and you played with some of the most talented players I remember, including Francisco Garcia, Taekwon Dean. Mm -hmm. So what, what was it like um, knowing that, you know, on any given night, whoever you're playing, your top three guys can probably beat those three guys. What was that like um, just on a, on a high elite D, D1 setting? It was cool, man. And, and I'll go back to the, the previous question before I uh, really quick. And my first couple of years, it, it was tough, man, because during that adjustment period, man, like I, the mental toughness aspect that like my confidence had really gotten shot, man, because adjusting and, not getting what he was trying to get me to get and in and, and my confidence was just really down, man. It just, you know, it kind of sort of stripped me all the way down. It's kind of like that process where I'm going to strip you down and then build you up. You know, that's, that's what I went through. And so then really coming into my junior year, man, was really about, you know, just getting my confidence back. It really was because after my freshman year, man, I was riding high. 
I, I was riding. I worked hard my, my sophomore year. And it was coming into my sophomore year. I wanted to earn a permanent starting spot. And uh, beginning of the year, man, I started. Then some things happened, and it just went downhill, man. It started snowballing. And so it was really about really gaining my confidence back. And once my junior year came, and, and it was really about building my confidence. And once I got my confidence back, you know, then my senior years happened. Then my senior year happened. But to answer your question, having sort of like a three-headed monster, man, that you know any given night can explode for twenty-five to thirty points. It was awesome, man, because it was. You didn't have three people. You you have one good defender. Some teams have two good defenders, but it's very rare to have three guys that could play lockdown defense on the perimeter. So it was just interesting to see who they were going to pick that night. And majority of the nights. You know, Francisco was the key target, so they wanted to stop Francisco. So, me and Taekwondo were licking our chops like, well, you know, who are you going to put on us? Because, you know, you can't put your strong you, – you know, you only got one defender that you're going to focus on Francisco. So, then Taekwondo and myself would get going. And now, all of a sudden, you switch the strong defender to myself or Taekwondo, and now Francisco gets going, and he gets everybody else going. So, it was pretty cool, man, to uh, play like a little chess match, a little cat and mouse to see, you know, what you were going to do or which poison you was going to pick. I, I would bet that you probably get asked a lot about the Elite Eight game against West Virginia when people ask about your career in general and that, that year mm -hmm. in 2005. But the game that I find more interesting is the Illinois game because – I always thought growing up that that was, you know, one Francisco Garcia big performance away from being a trip to the national championship, which Larry, I got to be honest with you. I feared I was never going to witness a Louisville championship as a kid and growing up into being an adult <laughs> because it hadn't happened since 80 and 86. And so that right. opportunity comes and it kind of slips through, but you look back and that team, I don't think that team Illinois gets enough credit for how good they were with Darren Williams and Luther head and, and D Brown. So take me back to that game and what you remember about matching up with them. Cause they were the bees knees of college basketball that year, man, they were absolute monster, man. And they were sort of built just like we were. They had a three headed monster. They had three guards, Luther head, Deron Williams, D Brown, the one man fast break. And, uh, man, it was just a perfect match. And it was just a matter of makes and misses. You know, that night we just had an off night. And, man, they got it going. And it was a pretty close game. And then they just hit one stretch, hit one run, man. And we just weren't able to bounce back. I, I think we ended up losing by, like, 15. But, you know, the, the score didn't indicate, you know, how good the game was. I think when we just got the foul and at the end of the game, that's what made the – score looked like what it was, but it was a great game. I think if we played 10 times, I think they went five. I think we went five just on that night. You know, they just got us, man. And they hats off to those guys. They uh, great team, great players, man. And so uh, Roger Powell really played well. Ellis Miles played really well that game. Uh, Ellis Miles um, took somebody off the dribble at the top of the game. Yeah. I watched that in the highlight and I was like, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ellis, Ellis Miles was skilled, man. Ellis yeah. Miles, he was really a blessing to Taekwon, Francisco, and myself because a lot of times if he got the rebound, and Juan Palacio, the same thing. If those guys got the rebound, we didn't have to call for the ball or we didn't have to like run back, grab the ball, and bring it up court. No, those guys get the rebound and push it. And that way we could just sprint the lane. And they were great passers. They were great screeners, man. And they just fit well with what we were doing. Speaking of screens, Alex, before you jump in, one of my favorite moments is Otis George <laughs> absolutely demolishing the Washington defender at half court. Bobby one Jones. Of, one of the best pick and rolls. I, well, it really wasn't even a pick and roll, but one of the best screens I have ever seen. Yeah, man. He, he laid Bobby out, man. That really set the tone for the game. After that, it just, you know, just it got us pumped up. And I really think it sent a message to them or what kind of game it was going to be. And I don't think they really recovered after that. That was just kind of like that eye-opener, like how physical and, and how tough we were. And so, uh, you know, we just kind of took it to them. They were a talented team too, man. They were super talented. May have been the most talented team besides North Carolina. Washington may have been the most talented team uh, in the tournament. Brandon Roy, Bobby Jones, Will Conroy, Trey Simmons, uh, Spencer Halls. Um, Nate Robinson. I was gonna say, wasn't Nate Robinson yeah. on that Nate team? Robinson, yeah, man, they were they were loaded, man. But uh, they just ran into a bus all that day. Mm -hmm. So you graduate from Louisville, and 
I remember you, you first started playing in the NBA Summer League overseas before you signed your – or NBA Summer League before you signed your first overseas contract. What were your mm-hmm. first expectations kind of going into the professional realm, and, and what do you remember most about those first few years in that transition? Um, man, I was really excited, man, because I, it was an opportunity for me to really display my skills. I was on my own now. Um, there was no more Rick Pitino. There was no more Taekwondo Francisco. It's sort of like you start your independent journey to supporting yourself. And uh, I was really excited, man, because I had worked hard, uh, really on developing and, and becoming a better player before I got there. And I really played well. Uh, I played with Seattle. Played out in Utah, man, and um, you know, I really thought I was going to be able to make training camp and, and go to uh, make a team. But um, that year, Nate McMillan was a coach. Uh, I think they had like seven free agents, and they were trying to figure out what they wanted to do. I think they would have invited me to training camp, but they were just slow on things moving. And so after playing, man, after playing really well, uh, EuroLeague team in Europe offered me a, a great contract. And so once I saw that contract, I'm like, this is where I'm going. I wasn't waiting around. So uh, I didn't want to wait. So I just took the European contract. So then I came back after my first year. I came back my second year. Um, I played with Dallas. And I was playing point guard. And, man, was playing really well. I played in Las Vegas. And then in Utah, they said, well, we're going to let you play in Vegas. We're going to let J.J. play J.J. Barea play in Utah. And so me and J.J. Barea were the point guards. And J.J. Barea didn't play in Vegas because I played. And so we went to Las Vegas, and I played a little bit, but J.J. was going to play more than, most of the minutes, which they had told me ahead of time. And, uh, man, J.J. put on the show, man. Him and Salim Stoudemire, man, were, were going at it. And, you know, J.J. was the one guy that they invited to training camp and kept him. And I couldn't even be mad at it, you know, because I played well, but he played really well, too. And he was probably more natural at the position than I was, um, really you know, playing the pick and roll. I played the pick and roll. I'm coming off the score. And, you know, I don't, then I didn't play the pick and roll as well as I do now, having played in Europe for so many years and really having the time and understanding of learning and knowing how to dissect the pick and roll. You know, J.J. sort of had that already before I had it because I was a natural two guard. I was playing the point guard, but I was a natural two guard. And so, uh, yep, J.J. Reddick, I mean, uh, J.J. Barea uh, ended up, you know, getting the spot and, you know, having a long career. And that was pretty much it. After that, I came back and tried a third time with Denver. But that third round, I uh, was already kind of like two classes out, some new young guys that came in. And uh, the first few games, I, you know, played well. I was playing well in practice, but I didn't really get a lot of playing time. And so after that, I just said, uh, you know what, this, this is it for me, man. I don't want to deal with no more political BS. And, you know, I just stuck with playing in Europe, man. All right, so I'm going to list all of the countries that you played in here. And this is, this is more so, obviously, <laughs> for our audience because you, you obviously know where you play here. But you've got Serbia, Italy, Greece, Bulgaria, Israel, Venezuela, Switzerland, and Argentina. I am sure there is one or two that I'm missing, but you got to play basketball – Literally all over the world. Uh, 16 yeah, Russia, years, France. 14, 15 year career, if I'm not mistaken, right? Because you just you yeah. just retired a couple of years ago. Uh, what was your favorite favorite thing about playing overseas, and what was the the favorite stop that you made? Uh, favorite part about playing overseas, man, was probably getting to travel and experience different things, different cultures, uh, meeting different people, man, and uh, just. Embracing, you know, different cultures, learning different languages, man, trying different foods um, and just broadening your horizons. Because the first thing that, you know, when I first went to Europe, man, I was so Americanized. I was so set and, you know, blinded by the American way that like it was either the American way. Uh, it, that was it, man. I, everybody, I wanted everybody to speak English and I wanted everything to be done a certain way of, of how I was used to doing it. And it was sort of like that American American arrogance and once you start to kind of tear down those walls and open yourself up to new things to try new things meet new people and and trying to do things different than the way you're accustomed to doing them your whole life man you start to you know like you know there's more than one way to skin a cat like you know it's a wonderful thing out here man being able to you know, embrace new cultures, and, you know, like I said, try new things. And it, it was just wonderful, man. And probably my favorite place 
um, it's Tel Aviv, Israel, you know, and, and the crazy part about it is that I was nervous about going there for a minute. My mom didn't want me to go at all. And I had a friend that was already playing there and I gave him a call. I said, man, how is it? You know, because all, all you know is what you see on the news, really. And he said, man, it's, it's nothing like what you see on TV. He said, man, you'll get here, you'll love it. And so I got there, man, and, you know, got to hanging out with my friend and he was taking me around and showing me different things. And that's probably my favorite place in the world. If I was to move anywhere outside the U.S., I moved to Tel Aviv, Israel. And that's, it, it, Italy's nice. Italy's nice. Italy be a close second. Buenos Aires probably be third. Um, but Tel Aviv, Israel, man, is probably one of my favorite places. Just the country of Israel, period, honestly. That would be an amazing place to visit. I have not been to Israel yet, but I, I, I did want to mention, so my brother-in-law is kind of wrapping up. He's uh, going on his 10th year of overseas basketball as well in Italy right now. Uh, but I did want to ask you just in your perspective, you know, you hear some athletes talk about the transition or, or battle of walking away, right? The, the competition, they never want to get rid of it. So what was your mindset on, on really, you know, the tail end of your career? And how did you know, you know, like this season was going to be my last season? Uh, probably a couple of years beforehand, you start seeing the writing on the wall. Um, your mind starts thinking about other things. Uh, basketball, sort of. It, basketball is a priority, obviously, because it's your job. But then you start thinking about other things, time with your family, time that you've missed. Um, you know, and for me, I, I spent all of my years, I wasn't married, you know, and I was dating a young lady. I'm married now to, to my wife. But, um, you know, you start, you know, thinking about settling down, starting a family, getting married, and, um, you know, being over there by yourself and you're missing out on so many things. My parents are not getting any younger. And my niece and nephews, who were eight and nine when I first started, they're going off, graduating from college now. And so many things are passing by. And on top of that, you're getting older. You're not as athletic as you used to be. You still play at a high level. Um, but, you know, you know, all of these things just start to accumulate. And then you're like, okay, well, how long do I want to play? And at first it was like, ah, I probably play to – I said I was going to play until I was 35. And then I was playing 35. I may have had one of my best years where I turned 35. And so I said, ah, you know what, I'm going to play a couple more. And then, you know, you start playing and all of a sudden, you know, practice is not the same. You're not motivated for practice. You know, I love playing in the games, but I'm, I don't want to practice. Then, you know, little nicks and aches start to, you know, creak in and you're not recovering as fast as you used to. And then all of a sudden, you know, your last year, you're trying to sprint down the floor. You may not be as fast. They jump as high. You may not be able to finish like you used to. And, you know, you can still play, but it's like, you know, all of, the, all of this perfect storm of things just start to come together. And it's like, well, you know, how do you feel about it? And, like, if you stop playing, like, how, how would you feel? And so I was thinking, I was like, eh, it's not really – you know, I love to love to play in the games, but I don't miss the practice. And so then, you know, when I came home, it was just like being time, you know, spending time with my family and, and being around my family, that started to take more precedent than me playing. And so at, at this point, it's like, you know, the money wasn't worth it for me anymore. And it's like, now that I'm retired, man, I'm, I'm at peace with it. Like, you know, I still get my craving of wanting to, get in the gym and I get out here, I still condition with my guys, keep myself in shape, but you know, I don't miss playing really. I, you know, I get my kick out of getting in the gym. I still work out, you know, just to stay in shape, but you know, do I miss playing? I'm practicing every day now. I was going to say, he did tell me he's spending twice the amount of time in the ice bath, but I'm going to let him know because he's 35 this year that you had your best season at 35. So no pressure <laughs> yeah, on him. I'm yeah, just going to let yeah, him know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no excuses. I wasn't, I, wasn't, but... I wasn't as athletic as I used to be, but, you know, I was smarter and I could still shoot. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. So now that, now that you're retired, you've stepped into to podcasting and uh, launched the player's perspective, as we mentioned at the top of the show. And, uh, you know, I got to hand it to you, man. You've, you've, the show is great. The interviews I've watched have been fantastic. Um, and Thank I got to tell you, if, in 2020, if we just had more Earl Clark showing up with sunglasses, 
places and places. I think this year would be better off, man. I really do. Uh, so, but I want to ask how that, how did that come about and what's, what's that been like for you, man? You've got to be enjoying it. You know, honestly, it all started um, a group of buddies. You know, we all get together at some time. We all play ball professionally and we don't really get a chance to see each other except during the summertime. And so when we get together at night, we play cards and just hang out and kick back and shoot the, shoot the, shoot the stuff, man. And we'd have some great conversations just about life, about what we were doing and everything. And I said, man, you know, the things that we talk about, it can be very inspiring and, and very motivating to some people, man. I said, it'd be, it'd be great for people to hear some of the things that we talk about and we can all share our different experiences of what we do. And so I got to thinking, man, I said, man, you know, it'd be great to, to have like a podcast or something just to, to have this. And I thought about it. And then I said, you know what, man, I said, I think I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm going to give it a shot, man. And so I started writing down my outline of what I wanted it to be like. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm like, everybody talks about basketball. You know, I said, what, what's going to make it stand apart? What, what, what makes it different? And so around the spring of last year, 19, like I started, I started, just got this instant interest in bourbon. And uh, because I knew I was retiring, I said, man, I just wanted to find something interesting. I said, you know what? I said, I always hear, you know, people talk about bourbon, bourbon, bourbon. So I remember trying it a little bit. I said, let me, let me, let me dive into it a little bit. And man, I started falling in love with it. And I said, you know what? That's the perfect storm. I said, I'm going to have a podcast. And initially, how the podcast was supposed to get set up, it was I was going to have a glass of bourbon and my guest was going to have a glass of bourbon. But with COVID hitting and then I thought about I wanted to get into coaching. I said, ah, the, the bourbon glass and the drinking on the show might not be the best image to put out there. I said, so I'll just have my reviews of, of me trying it and then put my reviews on the podcast with the interview. So uh, that's how it came to be, man. And uh, it's been wonderful. It's time consuming a little bit sometime with the editing and uh, coming up with questions and research in the bourbon and researching your guests and things like that. But once you get on there, you just get to talking, man, everything just kind of comes natural. And uh, it's really been wonderful just to catch up with people, man. You, you reminisce and so many stories come back up just having a chance to catch up and talk to people, man. So it, it's been wonderful, man. I love it. Alex, you said you, you've got a comment you want to throw in? Oh, I was just going to ask, have you tried, uh, speaking of bourbon and Louisville basketball, I mean, have we haven't had a chance to try uh, the Russ Diculous bourbon yet. So I didn't know if you got a sneak peek, uh, <laughs> being that you're an alum, if you've mm -hmm. tried his his bourbon, uh, that apparently is, is supposed to be pretty good. But I'm, it, I'm not a huge it, bourbon it, head Is myself. it released, man? I, I, I haven't been able to, Russ been avoiding me, man. I've been trying to get <laughs> Russ on my podcast, man. Russ been avoiding me. But no, I haven't had a chance to. I'm pretty sure once I, I run into it, man, I'll definitely uh, support Russ, man, and give it a try. Would love to. I'm, I'm definitely going to review it on my podcast, but I haven't got a chance to uh, try it. Is it out? I don't think it is. Yeah, I don't yet, think it but is yet. We figured you got oh, that. Yeah, you got that yeah, alumni I, connection. I, <laughs> not being in Louisville probably hurt me, but next time I get in Louisville, I'll definitely try to link up and see if I can get a sneak peek, man, and give you guys a, a review and, and preview of, of how it's going to taste. I'll watch it. All right, man. I, I, we, we end our, our first set of, of questions on the show the same way every single time. And this is a, a very easy question, and you can kind of answer this however you want, man. But okay. um, how has basketball impacted your life most? How has basketball impacted my life most? Um, it's been great as far as, honestly, just making friends. Uh, it's allowed me to have lifelong relationships that have opened the door to, to many things. It's opened the many things to maybe business relationships, to, you know, having people in my wedding, to, you know, having best friends. Uh, it's helped me, you know, open the doors to multiple avenues, man. And it's just been beneficial with teaching you life lessons, uh, you know, about discipline, about hard work and about adversity, and about, you know, staying with things and about, um, how things may not go your way, but, you know, persevering and, and staying in the long run about having to plan, you know. Hello? We're still here. You're all good. Okay. 
uh, about having a plan, about having goals. It's, it's taught me a wide range of things, and I've just been grateful uh, for the many things that it's done for me, done for my family. It's allowed us to travel the world. And I always get on people about when they walk in the gym. You know, I, was, I coach uh, down here in Atlanta at a high school, and some of my young guys walk in the gym, and they start shooting the ball, walking the court, shooting the ball with their shoes untied. And I immediately, I, I, have, I don't have a lot of rules, but the first rule that I have is respect the game. You know, game will do a lot for you if you just respect the game. And the first way you respect the game is lacing your shoes up before you get on the court. You know, take a shot, do anything. Make sure you lace your shoes up. Now, you can walk outside the court with your shoes unlaced, but once you walk between them lines, make sure your shoes are laced up. Respect the game, man. So um, that's what has been uh, how it's affected me and, and the many wonderful things that it's allowed for me and my family. Fantastic, man. That's a great answer. Alex, make sure you tie your shoes next time we go play basketball, man, because I'm going to I'm gonna have to get on you if you don't tie those shoes. <laughs> All right, let's transition into the last part of the show. Again, this is, a, this is a staple of every show. We call this before the buzzer. This is just our rapid fire question. So right. uh, the, the name of the game is quick answer. So we'll start here. The, the best player you played with either in college or professionally overseas? Best player I played with? Mm. Uh, Reese Gaines. That's a good answer. Which player at Louisville over the last 15 years has reminded you most of you? Mm. Probably Jerry Smith. Interesting. Okay. All right. The one Rick Pitino, uh, Rick Pitino coach player at Louisville that you wish you could have played with? Player, Peyton Siegel. Um, coach, not, I'm, all my coaches were great, man. I'm trying to think of who he's had after me that I may have wanted to play for. Um, I had a pretty all-star lineup myself. Reggie Theus, Nick Cronin, Kevin Willard, Vince Taylor, um, Matt O'Grady, Dan McHale, uh, Wiley Brown. No, I had an all-star lineup, man. I had a, had a great coach staff. Alex, before you jump in here, I got to say, how weird was it for you to see David Padgett on the sidelines being his <laughs> former teammate? You know what, man? I loved it. I love it. That's a great friend of mine. Me and DP talk all the time. But it was, it was funny. But it was perfect because playing with DP, you know how smart, how intelligent, how much of a high IQ he has, man. Um, so it, it, it wasn't surprising. But if we had DP in that Illinois game, Oh, it would have been over. It would have made a world difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have made a world difference. I believe that. So I got, I got an easy one for you. Favorite thing so far about being retired? Uh, relaxing. Relaxing. <laughs> All right. What's relaxing. The, I, I think I know the answer to this, but what's your least favorite thing about being retired? Uh, my least favorite thing? Competing. I, I would have thought it would have been the checks hitting the bank account, but I'm not a man that's retired, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You missed that's number that, two. But the, 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 comp the competition, I missed the competition. I missed the competition. The one person you'd like to have on your podcast most? Mm, Shannon Sharp. <laughs> skill, skill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> last one here, most if influential. I on that, that'd be great. Yeah, you got to bring Skip Bayless with you, though, man. All right, but the last one, the most influential person uh, to your career as a basketball player? My dad. Awesome. My dad, yeah. most influential person, man. He's a person that, you know, he's he's always been my coach, always will be my coach uh, on and off the court, man. Um, he's the one to put the ball in my hands. He's the one that showed me my uh, famous jump shot, man, the, the one that's helped me take me all over the world, man, it's helped provide a platform for him myself and help me uh, my family uh, with the uh, situation and accommodations that we have man and allow me to make a living doing it man so my dad is uh, definitely my biggest influence fantastic man tell the tell the audience where they can find your podcast and uh, more about uh, what you've got going on the player's perspective uncensored podcast with larry o'bannon available on all podcast platforms your favorite podcast platform uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Uh, it's on YouTube. A great way for you guys to see how we interact with our our guests. Uh, we review different bourbons. We talk to uh, aspiring, motivational, professional people, whether it be 
basketball players, whether it be financial advisors, anybody that has some uh, way of inspiring or, or passing on knowledge to the next people. Uh, we release every Monday. Uh, great way for you guys to come out and check out. It's uncensored now, so uh, we we say any and everything on there. It's not it's not vulgar, but we we speak of how we feel it on there. So a uh, great way for you guys to uh, check out different guests and myself, how we interact, man. Definitely yeah. check us out. I, I got to tell you, I've listened to just about every single episode and the, the interviews are great. I love the guests you have on because it like brings my childhood back. You've had Edgar Sosa, Earl Clark, Alvin Sims. I mean, the list yeah. is going on and on. Chris Redman. Yeah. Uh, I'm waiting for Rick Patino, man. I'm waiting I'm for you Rick. to make that get, happen. I'm, I'm going to get Rick on there, man. I, I was supposed to get Rick a, a little bit while he was in Greece, but we weren't able to connect. But I'm going to get Rick on there. I got um, who I got coming up, man. I got. Uh, probably a couple guys way before you guys are born. Cornelius Holden. <laughs> um, <laughs> got a couple because I'm my guest, man. We want to hear some of the OG players. I'm like, all right. So right. I got Cornelius Holden coming on. I got Keenan Martin coming on. Uh, I have uh, Rajon Rondo coming on once the finals is over. Um, I, got a good list of, I got a good list of players coming up. I'm going to get D'Angelo Russell. Uh, I couldn't catch Devontae Parker before the season started, but – um, uh, I'll keep you guys entertained, man. I'll have some uh, some guests, and I also have some more professional people coming up as well, non basketball people, but nice. uh, who um, affect the athleticism, you know, who are connected to the athletic world in some shape, form, or fashion, like your financial advisors or your agents, things like that. So uh, we always try to keep it interesting, man, not just staying in one lane and, and becoming tedious and boring. Yeah, right, man. absolutely, man. Well, it's been it's been great so far. For those of you who haven't listened, make sure you check that out. Uh, Larry, this has been a real treat for us. Thank you for for coming on the show. You're actually the first former Cardinal that we've had on, but uh, a couple of your teammates are going to be following behind you here. So you've set the the bar high for what a good show looks like. So thank you for that. Uh, and we'll be we'll be listening to the podcast and uh, you know keeping track on on your coaching career. Man, I appreciate it. When it comes out, man, make sure you guys let me know, man. I really appreciate you guys for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Larry. Appreciate it. All right, talk to you guys later.